Welcome. Um, just about seven o'clock on the dot. I know the World Series starts in a little over an hour, so we'll hopefully uh, get through this relatively quick. Um, thank you all for coming. Welcome to November. Um, here in Baltimore, it's about 43 degrees currently. Um, and a little gloomy out. Um, we are uh, very excited this evening to have um, a last name, which is baseball royalty, as everybody knows, um, speaking to us. Um, Lindsay Barra is uh, Yogi's oldest granddaughter, I believe. She can correct me any facts <laughs> I screw up. Um, I'm old. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully she's joining us from North Jersey. I don't know where she's at today. Um, I am, yes. For uh, those of you who remember, went to Sabre, I'm dating myself now, in 2017 when it was in Manhattan. Uh, Lindsay was on a panel with George Vesey and a few others um, talking about the uh, the impact her grandfather had. And that was probably a year or two after he passed away. Um, hopefully you all saw the, the documentary, um, not the whole documentary, at least the, um, the preview um, clip. Um, it was wonderful. I watched it in its entirety twice. Um, and we're going to find out from Lindsay a little bit uh, about herself and her involvement with this. And, um, and I know it's up for a couple yeah. of awards, so she will fill you in. Uh, if you don't mind, everybody can be on mute and we'll uh, get to some Q&A and stuff um, when we're finished. Thank you, Linz. Cool. I'm just going to give you like some quick background on me and, and, and the movie and I'll answer like some of the questions that are like the most common questions. And then you guys can uh, ask me whatever you like. Did if, Raise your hand if you did see the movie. Anybody? Okay, so a, a handful of people had. I, I went to NYU today to speak to two classes, sports journalism classes, uh, for which the documentary was assigned on the syllabus, and they had a free link to access it. And 40 kids, only 36 of the uh, 36 of the 40 had not watched the film. And I was like, why am I here? Why did I drive all the way into Manhattan if no one has seen the film? Um, anyway, so I am Lindsay Barra. Um, I am Yogi's oldest grandchild. Sometimes I like to say first because I feel like oldest ages me, um, but it doesn't change the facts. I am the oldest grandkid. Um, I grew up here in New Jersey. I played all the sports growing up. I played uh, varsity softball and uh, men's club ice hockey at the University of North Carolina. Uh, go Tar Heels. I I'm really enjoying being a, a football school for a hot second right now. It's kind of fun. Um I uh, started after college. I was at ESPN Magazine for 13 years where I covered mostly hockey and tennis, but also baseball, boxing, roller derby, Pop Warner football, three Olympic games. I was in Torino, Beijing and Vancouver. Um, did a lot of fun stuff uh, at ESPN. I left there in 2012, went to MLB.com and MLB Network. I was there for six years. My job was to write stories for the dot com and then go on television and talk about them. Um, I got laid off there in 2018. I've been freelance ever since. Um, Pre-COVID, I was doing a lot of stuff for Sports Business Journal, Men's Health, um, you know, even some freelance stuff back for ESPN, things like that. Uh, Post-COVID, my biggest nut is um, I work with uh, Coach Tom House. Tom House was a pitcher in the big leagues for nine years, but he... Um, is kind of the uh, known as the the father of modern pitching mechanics. He's been doing biomechanical analyses of pitchers since the late seventies, um, and there are still big league teams that don't do that. And um, he had all this data, forty plus years of biomechanical data on elite pitchers like Greg Maddox, Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, like good ones. And he was also the throwing coach for Drew Brees and Tom Brady. Worked with most of the NFL quarterbacks over the last fifteen years. Um, he has Parkinson's disease and he didn't want his data to be lost to history. So um, he partnered with some entrepreneur type folks, some engineers, and they they digitized all of Tom's data and built an AI driven pitching mechanics app where if you take a 2D video of your kid, it overlays Tom's 40 plus years of data and spits out an 11 uh, mechanical variable biomechanics report, the ones you don't pass 
It gives you a coaching plan to improve them. What's cool about that is that most people get a biomechanics report and they have no idea what to do with it. Um, but this, even like a dad, if your kid fails balance or posture, which has to do with head position or stride length or timing, there's a whole bunch of drills that he can do to improve it. And the kids can see it in real time. And that really resonates with them nowadays because they're so used to video games. So if they see it and they look like the little video game and then they try it again and they're, they feel a little better about what their mechanics look like. It's nice. We get all these notes. The kids are, uh, you know, more confident going out on the mound. And that's, you know, at this point in my career, I kind of like helping 10 year olds instead of, you know, waiting for days and days for Aaron Judge to call me because, you know, one is more gratifying than the other. Anyway, um, the movie, I would love to say that um, it was my idea, but it was not. Um, the opening scene of the film, you see me rather indignant that my grandfather was not included in the um, greatest living baseball players prior to the 2015 All-Star Game in Cincinnati. That was Hank Aaron, uh, Willie Mays, Johnny Bench and Sandy Koufax. And I was sitting in the room watching the, the ball game with my grandpa Yogi. And I was like, what on earth? Why is he not included in this group? Like, not that he should have replaced them, but there should have been five people out on that field. Um, you know, and I was irritated, but I'm not a filmmaker. So it never occurred to me to use that as a jumping off point for a film. Peter Soboloff is the big producer of our documentary, and he's been playing in my grandfather's museum um, golf outing for many, many years. In the summer of 2018, as he tells it, his wife Imelda dragged him kicking and screaming to see the Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor?, and it was actually a lovely movie and he ended up loving it. And my grandfather's museum golf outing was the next day. And he ran into my dad and uncles and said, how come there is no Mr. Rogers documentary about your father? And in true bear fashion, the three of them said, because no one's ever made one. Um, so Peter said, well, can I? And he had done a movie previously with our director, Sean Mullen, who uh, played rugby at West Point. So he was an athlete and a military veteran. He's just a big teddy bear of a human being. And my dad and uncles really liked him immediately. And, and you know, if someone was going to tell grandpa's story, they thought Sean was a great guy to do it. I met him shortly thereafter and got involved really just from um, a logistical perspective. Like I started peppering Sean with like, I wrote this, or this was a great story. You got to read this, look at this picture, yada, yada. And then it was like, Sean, Vin Scully is like 95. Audrey Graziola is 95. Roger Angel is almost 100. Um, you know, Hector Lopez and Tony Kubek and Bobby Richardson are really, Ralph Terry, the only teammates left. And these are all old people. And if you don't hurry up and interview them, they might not be available for an interview. So we got to get a move on. And you're a Hollywood person. You don't need these. You don't know these people. So you need me. So I got involved in just from a logistical perspective, setting up interviews with all the people I could come up with who grandpa had played with or who had seen grandpa play. And as we rolled along after listening to my stories and doing some interviews with me, um, you know, well, the pandemic happened. Let me back up a little bit. We, we shot from uh, May of 2018 to March 7th, wait, May, May of 2019, to March 7th of 2020, we flew home on March 8th of 2020. And then the world stopped like three days later. Right. So we had a 14 month break, um, for the pandemic. I do not recommend anyone making an independent film with a 14 month pandemic in the middle of it, because as they say, time is money and it really is. <laughs> um, so don't do that. Um, but in, in, during that time, Sean had a meeting with the other producers kind of behind my back and they came back to me and said that they had decided that I was going to narrate the film. And I was like, wait, what about the plan for Billy Crystal or John Goodman or Bob Costas or someone who has some sort of voiceover experience in their life, as opposed to me who has none. And they're like, no, 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 it's going to be you. You're going to, you're going to do it. And I thought it was a terrible idea. Um, but they wouldn't let me off, let me off the hook. So I used the COVID uh, break to learn how to sort of do voiceovers. And then I ended up narrating the, the film. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit. So I'm not just rambling. We premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2022 in New York. We had uh, the first uh, screening was a thousand seat uh, theater sold out. And then we had five other shows that were also sold out. But, you know, six selling out six shows of a Yankee movie in New York City 
I don't know. I mean, it was cool, but I don't know that it, I thought it was representative of what the rest of the world would think of the film. Um, we did have great feedback after those screenings at Tribeca. Um, and it, some of the stuff that was really heartening to us was that it was it was a lot of non-baseball fans who were really enjoying the movie. There was a woman from Hong Kong, Hong Kong who was in town and just bought tickets to whatever movie was available at the Tribeca Film Festival. She had never seen a baseball game in her life. She loved the movie and then bought tickets to a Yankee game the next day. We had a man come up to my to Sean, the director, and tell him that the film had inspired him to be nicer to his wife. That one we thought was a little fishy. We were like, do we need to do some investigating here? Um, but, you know, the love story between Grammy and Grandpa had resonated with that guy. Um, but we still weren't totally sure. And after all of those showings, Sean, the director, tells me, I want you to come to Nantucket with me. We're we're playing the film at the Nantucket Film Festival. And I was like, Sean, that's like literally an entire island of Red Sox fans. I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I don't think that's safe to show a Yankee movie on an island with no escape. What if the next ferry is not coming for a long time and they're chasing us to the dock, right? Um but that ended up going really well also. And we actually had one of my favorite reviews after Nantucket. Um, the guy wrote that the closing credits were met with rapturous applause and the sound of grown men weeping. Um, and since then, it has been my my goal to make a few grown men cry at every screening. So I hope one or two of you who saw it shed a few tears. That would make me happy. Um but anyway, after that, you know, we had these great showings and it still took us a minute to sell the documentary. You have to sell, you do festivals. So a distributor picks it up and helps you get it to theaters or get it to a streamer or whatever. Um, Sony Pictures Classics bought the movie in September. They decided to wait till the following, start of the following baseball season. They put it in theaters on May 12th of 2023, which would have been grandpa's, uh, God, 98th birthday um it ran in the theaters for close to three months it was a really nice theatrical run for a documentary um it was in 800 theaters across the country um and, and did did pretty well um and then it, it started on amazon prime and apple tv on d-day on june 6th um and ran there all summer and actually just premiered on netflix uh last week october 26th so now you can watch it for free streaming on netflix um that's been really gratifying for me because 77 million people on netflix and folks are really watching it i've gotten literally over the last five days thousands of messages on my twitter and instagram and linkedin and such from folks who are watching it and really enjoying it. And, and I'm pretty happy about that. I don't think Sony's happy that people are watching it on the free place more than the, the paid platforms, but I just want people to see it. Um, you know, I didn't, you don't make an independent film thinking that you're going to make any money on it. And we are a long, long way from making even a dime on this movie, but you know, I did it. So people would remember my grandfather. So my philosophy is more eyeballs, more better. And we're getting a lot of eyeballs on, on Netflix. So I'm, I'm really happy and, and grateful for that. Um, I don't know. I could keep yapping or you guys could ask some questions. You guys have questions, put them in the chat. Oh, I can hold, go pay attention to that. Hold on a second. Where's my chat? Do I have access to the, ch where is the chat? You should. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Oops. Okay. I went to NYU, but would certainly have done the assignment back in the day. Thank you. I would have done it too, or my parents would have beaten me. Hmm. I have been... Do you have any problems using the raise hand feature for uh, questions too? We, we could I don't know how to do uh, let, let me let me go through these real quick um uh we've been watching this film I've seen this movie probably 140 times now and I'm not exaggerating um Sean and I have started doing well we're, when we when we go to screenings we'll introduce the film and then we set a timer for like seven the movie's 98 minutes we set the timer for for 75 minutes and because we want to come back, we like to see people watch the perfect game because people forget it happened on Yogi Berra Day and it's it's kind of cool to watch. 
<laughs> but coming back at 75 minutes means every time we do a screening, I have to watch both of my grandparents die over again. Um, mm. And it's it's rough. <laughs> it's rough. Um, so I, wow. I, still, I still shed some tears every time I watch it. Just hearing my grandmother's voice kind of makes me makes me cry. Um, many books about my grandpa Yogi. Any favorites? My favorite of the big ones is the one that Alan Barra did. Eternal Yankee. B-A-R-R-A. -R -R -A, no relation to me, but I think that that's funny. Um, I think he just did a really good job. What would my grandpa say about the film? Um, I go back and forth with thinking that he would be really proud of us. Um, I know he would love seeing the archival footage, but then also thinking he would keep, he would be like, would you stop talking about me already? <laughs> um, but I, I think he'd be pretty proud of us for putting together, um, such a, a cool thing. You know, we got, he, he, he got the U S postage stamp, um, a few years back. And I think he would have been just tickled with, with that one. The, the fact that this Italian immigrant kid from the Hill was on a U.S. postal uh, postage stamp would have just blown his mind. And I kind of think the movie would have, um, blown his mind as well. Do I know the methodology about the greatest living players? So I, they advertised it as a, a vote from 25 million fans, but I was told by some MLB sources that it would, the vote was sort of vetted by, by MLB as well. And if that is the case, I, I can't believe nobody said, you know, Yogi should be in there. Like that, that just kind of blows my mind. Um, Grandpa and Joe Garagiola. So grandpa my great grandfather pietro and joe gragiola's father came from italy around the same time and grandpa's parents were at 5447 elizabeth avenue and joe was at 5446 elizabeth avenue directly across the street um grandpa was born in may and i think joe when was joe Joe's like seven or eight months younger. I don't remember exactly when his birthday was, but Joe says that he thinks that grandpa is the first guy he ever saw. And he doesn't remember a time in his life when he didn't know Yogi, which is really sweet. Um, especially when you consider that I had Joe on the phone with grandpa the night before grandpa passed, which means they were literally friends for 90 years. I don't know too many people who can say that they had a friendship that, that lasted a full 90 years. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, they did so many things together. There's the famous story about Grandpa and Joe and, and Red Shane Deist actually was in there too, going to an open tryout at Sportsman's Park in St. Louis in uh, 1942. And Branch Rickey was the general manager of the Cardinals at the time. He offered Red and Gragiola 500 bucks to sign. He offered Grandpa 250, knowing full well that there was no way Grandpa was going to sign for half of what his pal Joey was getting. Um, but Branch had ulterior motives. He knew he was leaving to go to the Dodgers and he wanted to wait and sign grandpa when he got to Brooklyn. Um, but that plan kind of blew up in his face. Uh, one of grandpa's Legion coaches uh, was friendly with a guy who was a Yankee scout and George Weiss swooped in and signed grandpa um, before Branch Rickey could get to Brooklyn and get his feet underneath him. So um, it would have been crazy if grandpa had been a Cardinal. It would have been crazier if he had been a Dodger. I don't know what would they would have done with Roy Campanella and and Grandpa on the same on the same team. Maybe Grandpa would have stayed an outfielder, um, but could have would have should have right. Um, and today, my dad is still really good friends with Joe Gragiola Jr. I actually was just texting him yesterday. He's a, a special advisor to the Arizona Diamondbacks, so we've been texting him after the the games and stuff. Um, I'm really good friends with with Joe's granddaughter Meredith, Joe Jr.'s daughter. Um, and Joe Gragiola likes to tell folks that the Barras have been friends for, and Gragiolas have been friends for 115 years, which is pretty cool. Um, my dad's relationship with his parents and what did they think? So my, my dad was Larry. He, he only played baseball up to the minor leagues. I think you're probably asking that question about Dale, Tom, is that right? Um, I mean, all of my dad and, and both of my uncles had great relationships with my grandparents. Um, it was kind of interesting. My my grandpa Yogi was on the road from, you know, February through October for their entire lives. Um, you know, they saw him for home games. He used to bring the, the boys to the ballpark 
all the time. Um, very, very involved. My dad and, and uh, my uncle Tim like grew up annoying the crap out of Mickey Mantle in the Yankees uh, clubhouse. Um, but he never saw any of his sons play a baseball game growing up ever. They, he saw all the basketball games, all the hockey games, some of the football games, but never a, a baseball game. Um, but you know, they, they were, they were really close. Um, they were obviously, you know, super proud of Dale being in the big leagues. My uncle Tim, um, played football for the Colts and the giants. Um, my dad played up through the Mets minor league system before, um, getting hurt. Um, so, and you know, we all live really close together here. Like, I mean, I can get to both my uncle's houses within about eight minutes and we had all of our holidays together. Um, you know, I have uh, 10, siblings and cousins all right in this in this area so everybody stayed has stayed um really close i meant uh, i mean um yogi's relationship with his parents oh with grandpa's parents i thought she meant my dad okay so you my not my dad my grandfather's relationship okay right. so my grandfather's relationship with his parents so he had three older brothers uncle mike uncle tony uncle john he would tell you that they were all better baseball players than he was but his parents kind of thought baseball was like a trivial pursuit and it wasn't going to amount to anything or earn anybody any money. And they were an immigrant family and everybody had to work to help feed everybody. So his three older brothers, all better baseball players than grandpa. And he would say that until the day he died, they had to work like they were working three jobs. They were working in restaurants. They were working in the shoe factory. They were delivering newspapers, anything that they could do on the Hill, they were doing to, to make money. Um, but when it got down to Grandpa Yogi, um, the three of them kind of ganged up on my great grandfather, Pietro, and said that one of them should have a chance to try to play baseball. And when Grandpa was about 10, they convinced my great grandfather, Grandpa, Grandpa quit school in the eighth grade. He was working and all that, but they did let him play baseball at that point. Uh, my Uncle Mike, who was arguably the best player of the bunch, uh, decided at that time I don't know if anybody who watched the movie noticed it. There is a quick shot of a picture of my grandfather on a sand lot with no shirt and, and no shoes and Joe Graziola over his left shoulder. But it's the only photo that exists of grandpa hitting right handed. He was a natural right handed hitter. And my uncle Mike decided to switch him around and have him hit lefty because he thought he'd have a better chance of making the big leagues as a left handed hitting catcher. And I think we all probably understand that Yogi Berra is not Yogi Berra if he's a righty so um that was a very um you know good decision by my my uncle Mike um and then at that point when I think when they they realized grandpa was pretty good they they said that they would let him go away to play as long as he sent his paycheck home so as long as somebody was making money in the deal it, it was okay um with my great-grandparents um and that was what he did. He went and he played for the Norfolk Tars and he, he made uh, his contract was for $90 a month and he would have gotten a $500 bonus had he stayed the whole year. But that was for the 42-43 season. He turned 18 on May 12th, 1943 and literally walked his butt over from the ballpark to the naval base and said, I enlist. Where do I go? Um, so he enlisted before he had a chance to be drafted. And um you know, ended up in the, in the D-Day thing. But for that whole part of the, the season, he was still sending his paychecks home to his, his parents. And he would do that, you know, for most of his career while his parents were, were alive. Let's see. Um, your girlfriend is a Philly fan and she cried several times. She probably cried for a few other reasons last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that photo of Don Larson that's in there. Grandpa's best friends on the Yankees. That team was so close. My dad tells stories all the time when we have museum events about, um, so they used to play Saturday day games and Sunday doubleheaders. And after the Saturday day games, everybody would go to somebody's house in Jersey. And it was often my grandparents' house because they had a really big yard with a pool. And, you know, on any given Saturday, you could drive by and see like Mickey Mantle, punting a, a, a football or Gil McDougal chipping golf balls or playing pepper with the kids. Like they were, they would all hang out. They was very close with Whitey. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, grew up with Hank Bauer, Moose Scourin, Phil Rizzuto coming in and out of my grandparents' house um, and didn't really think anything of it. They were all really, really close. Um, 
he was close with Frank Crosetti, Eddie Lopat. Um, he was really close with um, like some Ralph Branca, um, Gil Hodges, obviously, uh, but Gil passed uh, very young. And then we're still really close with Gil Hodges Jr. Um, Grandpa stayed really close with Gossage, Guidry, um, uh, Rick Cerrone, like these, these folks we see kind of all the time. Um, let's see. You mentioned that Yogi was responsible. Oh, so the hinge catcher's mitt thing in the question here. So 1955, when Jackie Robinson stole home in the, uh, world series, I think everybody knows grandpa insisted until the day he died that Jackie had been out. Um, he was obviously called safe. And grandpa at the time was using one of those big fat donut catcher's mitts. So he had to catch the ball, cover it with his hand and go over there to make the tag. And he always said that had he been able to make a one handed sweep tag, it would have been more obvious to the umpire Bill Summers that Jackie had, in fact, been out um, at the end of that season. He got his first glove contract with Spalding and had a chance to, like, give some input on what he wanted the catcher's mitt to look like and some of them had like a small hinge but he had that glove the 55 spalding model of grandpa's glove has the deepest it's it's the in the hinge is like an inch and a half deep you can fold the thing in half without it even being broken in so and that was directly because he wanted to be able to make sweep tags because of that jackie robinson play so i, I tell all the kids who come to the museum that in addition to breaking the color barrier in baseball uh jackie revolutionized the catcher's mitt so that is that <laughs> right <laughs> um, I never in my life saw my grandpa drink a yoo ever. Um, but one of my favorite yogiisms has to do with yoo Um, and some people may have heard it, but I'll tell it again because it's a good one if you haven't. Um, 1958-ish, 59, I don't remember the exact year, grandpa and Mickey Mantle are introduced as the pitchmen for yoo and there's a press conference in New York. And there was a female reporter in the front row. And grandpa told me this story because I was in college to become a female reporter. And uh, she raises her hand and she says, excuse me, is that hyphenated? Meaning you who? And grandpa said, lady, it ain't even carbonated. So <laughs> that, that's one of my favorite. Uh. Um, Joe said he wasn't the best player on his block. That's yes. It's, he's like, he said, when you make the big leagues, you're usually the best player in your, in your high school, in your town, in your County, maybe in your state, but with grandpa living across the street, he right. wasn't even the best player on his block. Um, many people have asked me if I wanted to write a bio about my grandfather. No, I don't want to. Um, I feel like the stories that I told, you know, in, in the documentary did a really good job. And I think the stories that I have left, I want to keep for me. Um, and also, I think that the only reason I was willing to do go along with this movie project was because I had such a great team of people around me um, helping to make it the best product that it could be. I think if I were to write a book, I would put so much pressure on myself that it would be a miserable experience. So I don't think I want to do that. Um is it true when your grandfather's name and walk by the famous picture of Robinson, he would always pause and say, yes and no he, he it wasn't like he was going out there and talking to the picture but everybody in my entire life I mean it must have happened I mean it happened thousands of times every time we went somewhere someone would ask him about Jackie Robinson and they would walk up with like a head full of steam wanting to ask him was Jackie Robinson safe or out and they would get was just they would get the first syllable of Jackie's name out and grandpa would just go out oh, he was out and if anyone ever disagreed with him, you'd get like a really loud bullshit or whatever. It was if you, <laughs> like if you watch the movie, the guys talk about how they could really get him going with it. Joe Torrey said Tori says it was no fun to agree with grandpa because then you couldn't get him going. So they would deliberately disagree with them. And it was it was really, really funny. Um, and even uh so grandpa and Jackie were were really good friends until Jackie passed in 1972. And but the Robinson family stayed tight with my family and Rachel was at grandpa's 90th birthday party. And at the time, grandpa was in a wheelchair. She walks into the room and she kind of sees him through the crowd and she bends down and she goes like this, makes the little safe. And grandpa goes like this through the crowd and stares at her. And then she walks over and gives grandpa a big hug and a big kiss. So it was very cute and very sweet. Um. So Phil Rizzuto, yes, that is true. Phil was in a... um assisted living facility at the end of his life in Tinton Falls, which is about, I don't know, 45 minutes from our house. 
And most days when Phil was there, like a, a lot of days, not every day, but a lot of days, grandpa would go down there and just play cards with Phil. They would watch TV, watch the ball game, watch Michael K talking about the Yankees. Um, and, you know, as Phil would start to fall asleep and not want to play cards anymore, grandpa would hold his hand. And as soon as Phil fell asleep, he would put his hand back on his belly and, and go home. So he was, uh, that was tough on grandpa when, when, when Phil, um, passed away they were really close phil is my father's um godfather my dad's godfather i think yogi mark twain and winston churchill have something in common and the three of them never said half the things attributed to them you have some of the yogiisms on the museums anyone track the things attributed to your grandfather okay um two two wrongs don't make a right not a yogiism and also stupid it doesn't make any sense most of the yogiisms make sense the one that I most often see that is attributed to grandpa that he 100% did not say always makes the rounds on Valentine's day. And I'm tagged in like 7 million posts on, on Twitter and Instagram and whatever. And it's that, um, love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty good too. Definitely did not say that. Um, <laughs> those are the only two that I see a lot. Um, but it, I mean, I'm sure if we Googled fake yogiisms, we could find an awful lot of them. People just attribute dumb things to him, but the yogiisms all, if you are open to the non-linear logic, they all make sense when you when you think about them. Um, even the ones that you think can't, like the fork in the road, take it on its surface does not make sense. But if you come here to Montclair and look at the street that he was talking about, there's, there's um, Upper Mountain Avenue, and Highland Avenue runs parallel to it. And Edgewood goes up and splits. And both sides of the split, it's like a Y, go to Highland Avenue, which was Grandpa's Road. And he told Phil, go to the fork. When you come to the fork, take it. Make a left at the top. You'll get to the house. Didn't matter which side you took because they both went to his street. And it makes perfect sense when you see it. Um, in my family, that's kind of become a euphemism for like, get off your ass. You know, this morning when I hit the snooze button three times, the third time, Lindsay, take the fork. Get out of bed. Let's go. Um, but yeah, the, the ones that are really yogiisms do, do make sense when you give them a second, uh, a second look, um, was it George Weiss or Casey Stengel wanted to join the Mets says, I understand that it was Casey, um, and grant, you know, grandpa was heartbroken and, you know, in 1964, um, you know, they lose in seven games to the Cardinals and they call him in and grandpa thinks he's going in for a raise and he gets fired and replaced with Johnny Keene, who was the manager of the Cardinals. Um, and he was just devastated. Like he'd been with the Yankees his entire career for almost 20 years at that point. And he didn't want to a leave the Yankees and he didn't want to be be out of baseball. And Casey was the manager at the Mets at that point. And as I understand it, Casey called and hired him um, as a coach. One of the greatest stories in the movie is about Phil Lins and Yogi in 1964. Phil Lins graduated from Calvert Hall for all you Baltimoreans. I agree. That is a very funny movie and I love a funny part of the movie. And I love the Johnny Carson clip. Um, if anyone hasn't seen that, you either have to watch the movie or Google Johnny Carson, Phil Lins and just watch the little joke. It's, it's really funny. Um, the Medal of Freedom campaign was one of it was like the hardest race I've ever run that I didn't know I was signing up to run. <laughs> um, I, I figured, you know, we, we were trying really hard for many years to get grandpa his purple heart. And so what happened there, he was on a, an LCSS uh, landing craft support small off of Omaha beach. He was a machine gunner's assistant. Um, that boat had six rockets on each side, twin 50 caliber machine guns on the back, and they were providing cover fire for the troops going ashore. There was active fighting for like two days or something, um, and everybody on their boat was hit. Uh, he just had a piece. He doesn't know if it was a piece of shrapnel or a bullet or whatever that went through his it went through, clean through his left hand. Um, so he's wounded in battle and nominated for the Purple Heart, but he declined to fill out the paperwork because he didn't want his mother to get a telegram and worry that he'd been hurt because she was already, you know, Italian moms dying a thousand deaths every moment that he was gone. Um, so. He never put in for it and for some reason, it, it just wasn't in his nature to kind of seek the honors, right? Um, later, you know, in like 
I'm trying to think when I first started thinking about it, like, I don't know, 2005 or something, he didn't have, he never kept anything. He never kept a single baseball card of his. He didn't keep a single pair of cleats. He kept one bronze glove that he used to, he had one glove bronze. It was the glove he used to um, catch Allie Reynolds uh, two no hitters in the summer of 52. Um, but pretty much everything else he got rid of. And he certainly didn't keep his army discharge paperwork. Right. So the story was that it, his discharge papers were burned in the 1973 archives fire in St. Louis. Um, I had many people tell me that that wasn't possible because the Navy paperwork had been in a different building. So I've been chasing down these leads literally for 15 years with different archives, having people go through deck logs, um, you know, ship manifests, trying to find any reference to grandpa being wounded because the Navy won't give you the Purple Heart until you can, unless you can prove that he was in fact wounded in battle. I had the Yankees go through all of their medical records to see if it was documented on like his intake physical. Um, anyway, couldn't find it, had congressmen try to help me, senators, three secretaries of the Navy, but nobody will bend the rules and we can't get these medical records um, and the, the last thing I said this in the movie was the Navy told me that um, my my last recourse was to find a witness to the event on social media. And I'm like, um, he was in the rocket boat with six people in 1944 and they're all over 100. Like they're posting regularly on Instagram. Give me a break. Right. So we we decided to think about the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom instead. It's not a military honor, but it's, uh, uh, you know, for folks who gave back to society in some, in some way. Um, and I think that grandpa did a lot of things to give back to society. So I start that petition and I think that, you know, a hundred thousand signatures, how hard can that be? It's like two full Yankee stadiums. I remember saying that to my dad and my uncles, like Yankee stadium seats, 56,000 people. We just get two of those and we're good to go. It was so hard. Like, so hard. I was going on every radio station, like trying to get my friends to, to like in, in, in sports media to talk about it and get people to sign this thing. And, and the museum website, Montclair state was blasting it out. And like, I mean, I, we did everything that we could, but you know, I think it, it was just hard to get people to go online and do something it, it, harder in 5th, 2015 than it would be now. And, uh, he had 30 days to get it done. And on day number 30, which was the day of my grandfather's golf out, and we only had 59,000 signatures um, in, in that morning. And I'm like, there's no way this is going to happen. And Michael Kay did his show broadcast from the parking lot at my grandfather's museum. And he talked about it and we started getting more. Um, I was, I, I was working a hole, like a challenge hole at the golf outing and then running out to the parking lot in between foursomes to do radio interviews with whoever would come and let me talk about this medal. Um, and at the end of the day, we had 86 or 87,000 when we went home, like around eight o'clock. And then I had my boyfriend, um, we were sitting on the couch with two laptops I had him Googling the name of every famous person who had ever attended a Yankee game. And I was tweeting at the person like, hey, at Alicia Keys, how about signing hashtag Yogi medal to get grandpa the presidential medal of freedom? And because those people have so many followers and you only need the, the, them to see it, they don't actually have to engage with you. We got Yogi medal trending pretty quickly and like under the wire ended up getting those signatures. And I, I was stunned. I didn't think it was going to happen. And I also can't believe I didn't think of that earlier. Um, so we get the signatures, the president's supposed to respond in 30 days. That was, that was, uh, um, June like 11th and they didn't respond until October, uh, and grandpa died in September. So, he knew he was, he had qualified for the medal and would likely get it, but he didn't know he was actually going to get it. That made me pretty sad. Um, but you know, I tell myself that he didn't, he wasn't the human he was because he thought it would get him a medal. He just was who he was. So it was still pretty nice to go down there and get the medal of freedom at the white house. It was a really cool day. Um, but, uh, I would, you know, I wish grandpa had been there to, to, to see it, but it's in the museum and the kids can see it. And, and that's pretty cool. Um, there's Phil Lynn's greatest generation. I don't know if I think Jackie was safer out. There's some angles where it's like questionable. So I like to take the high road and say safer out didn't matter. What mattered is that Jackie was in, in big league baseball. I'm just going to take the high road and uh, on that one. 
Um, grandpa might like smite me from beyond. You never know. Like my, my windows might shatter or something. Um, grandpa never talked about his D-Day experiences ever. Um, he, my dad took him to see Saving Private Ryan. And after that, he said like a few things. My, my dad had never heard him say anything in my dad's entire life. And Saving Private Ryan came out when my dad was like, I don't know, 55. So it had been a long time without hearing grandpa say a word about, about D-Day. Um, once after seeing a Band of Brothers episode with him, um, he just said something about um, how it was hard, like ne never went into to detail about it. Um, but there was one experience that I had that was pretty surreal. It was like 2013, maybe. So two years before grandpa passed. Um, and, you know, he's 88 years old and falls asleep a lot while he's watching television, right? Um, we had a D-Day event at the museum and there was a new PBS documentary out about D-Day that had some never before seen uh, battle footage of, of the actual landing on, on Omaha Beach. And in the footage, you see the big German 88 guns. And it, it was like intense, like, even though it was black and white and grainy, it was like, you know, loud and you could see how chaotic it was and whatever. And I was sitting a couple of rows behind grandpa. He, Tommy Lasorda was there with him. And the two of them were like, they got their heads bowed. And I thought that they had fallen asleep and it was like dark. So I went, I went down, kind of crawled out of my seat and went down and sat on the floor in front of grandpa. And he wasn't sleeping. He, he had his head down and he was going like this. And he was basically doing this like low whistle and he was remembering the sound of the German 88 guns and had totally gone back there um, in his mind. And I was like, hey, hey, grandpa, you know, step out of it. Here we are. And he was like, oh, hey, you know, whatever. Like he he had definitely gone somewhere else um, in his mind. So I, I think it was uh, pretty close to the surface and he just didn't uh, let it come out very often. Um, how long did it take to get used to seeing Yogi in a Houston Astros uniform? So I was only six when he was fired by the Yankees. So it wasn't like I had this like vast cachet of pinstriped grandpa memories. Um, so it didn't take me very long. I, 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 as a kid thought the Astrodome was pretty cool. I got to go down there and visit him and run around on the outfield. It was like really spongy. And if you tried to do cartwheels and, and handsprings on it, it gave you like a little help. So I, I thought Houston was great. <laughs> Um, I really liked it when he came back, uh, and played the Mets in 1986, um, but they lost, but anyway, um, which quote did you try to use in a business ad and get vetoed? Alec? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. They didn't like it? They didn't know. I, I hate, I, this is not the group to say this to, but I honestly don't think they knew who your grandfather was. <laughs> Well, I mean, tell, you should send them the movie link now. Uh, okay, maybe I will. <laughs> Good suggestion. Um, so I don't think Grandpa had any regrets about starting Tom Seaver in Game Six of the World Series. I think that he, who was the guy who was supposed to start, I'm forgetting. He wasn't throwing very well, and Tom was throwing. And I think George Grandpa, Stone. Who was it? George Stone. George Stone. I think that he thought Tom Seaver had a better chance of winning than George Stone and grandpa didn't want to lose with George Stone and then pitch Tom Seaver in game seven. I think he was, uh, you know, subscribed to the Leo DeRocher school of thought and never save a pitcher for tomorrow because it might rain. Right. Um, and I think he was just playing the the numbers and, and thought that that was the best thing to do. And Tom had had just as much rest as he had had for the most of the season. And he didn't think it was a, a big deal. So you know, you can't predict things. This is why we play the games. Um, and I think he 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 would have done the same thing over again. Um, and, you know, I think he also thought that, you know, they were so out of it in, in August and they had come back. And I think he thought that they were riding a wave and it was all going to be OK. But alas. Um, why he switched to eight from 35, I think it was for Bill Dickey. I think he kept the 35 until Bill left and then. uh put the eight on i don't know that 100 percent, but that's what i think um and how much grandpa meant to yogi he meant so much to grandpa um 
he would tell you that he was a terrible catcher before Bill Dickey got a hold of him. Um, and, you know, it really shows how much Bill meant to grandpa when you look at what grandpa did for Elston Howard. Um, imagine a, a player today, like spending three years mentoring a guy to take his job. Like it would never, ever happen. And that is very much what grandpa did for Elston Howard because Bill Dickey had done it for him. Also, he really liked Ellie. Um, and they were very close. Um, you know, the Yankees are one of the last teams to integrate. Elston comes in in 1955, but Florida, we're still 10 years ahead of the civil rights movement. Florida is still very much segregated. Um, Elston wasn't allowed to ride the bus with the Yankees or go to the hotels with the Yankees or eat in the restaurants with the Yankees. And grandpa would often go to the, the black hotels and black restaurants and stay with Ellie. So he wouldn't have to be by himself. Um, they were very close. Elston also obviously died very young. Um, but Arlene Howard is still a fixture at the museum. She's 97 and amazing. And her daughter, Cheryl, that they're around all the time. They were very close um, with my grandparents um, and, you know, would come and have, have they'd have dinner together very often, um, even after Ellie was gone. Did Yogi ever mention if he thought the call third strike on Dale Mitchell's was really a strike? I don't think he cared. <laughs> Um, you know, when you look at it, it doesn't look like a strike, but it, as soon as grandpa heard them say strike, he obviously had already leapt, leapt out and jumped on Donnie and there was no calling that one back. Um, for the folks who didn't see the movie, um, and I'll just tell the story. My grandmother was watching that game with Joni Ford and, uh, she was eight ish months pregnant with my uncle Dale. Dale was due in December and Dale Mitchell comes up for that last at bat. And she said, if we get this out, I'll name my baby Dale, boy or girl. And I do, in fact, have an Uncle Dale. So that's that's a great story from the movie that I think a lot of people don't actually know. Um, and then somebody said, um, um, it's really good that Rube Walker wasn't the last batter. <laughs> um, I'd have an Uncle Rube or an Aunt Rube. Who knows? <laughs> um, it's amazing. Grandpa caught every day for so many years. And today if catchers play 120 games, it's a lot. Yes. Uh, and also grandpa was, um, you know, he was catching 120 games a year and also hitting the way he was hitting, which is crazy. He, we were actually wrong in the movie. We said he caught both ends of double headers 117 times in his career. It was 119 times. So, so 119 times in his career, he, he caught 18 games in a wool suit in the summer, which is, you know, just crazy. Um, very, very durable. Um, my dad told a story the other day, we had a, uh, uh, an event at the museum and it was like grandpa, Johnny bench, Gary Carter, maybe Carlton Fisk. It was all catchers. And, um, they, Tim Russert was the moderator of this panel and Tim went down and wanted everybody to talk about like, Oh, how many surgeries have you had? Or like, how's your body? Right. And like, you know, um, Gary Carter had had like 48 knee surgeries and Johnny Bench had had a bunch of knee surgeries and was getting his shoulder done. And and whoever the third guy was, I forget, all, a whole bunch of surgeries. And grandpa was like, I've never had a surgery, Tim. And Tim was like, bullshit. And he was like, no, I've, I've never had a surgery. Grandpa had his first surgery, had a knee replacement when he was 78 years old, but he made it his whole life without having anything wrong with him. Um, the only injury I ever remember him talking about was he broke his thumb once and um his mother told him to cut a hole in a lemon and stick the lemon on his thumb and it would draw out the inflammation or so the swelling. And um, there was a funny story. I saw a little newspaper clip on it one time where the Yankees, I guess, had like a terrible game. Nobody was hitting. And somebody asked Casey Stengel what was going on the team and on with the team. And he was like, I have no idea. This guy's doing this. Nobody can hit. And my catcher's got a lemon on his thumb. Like it was just like this you know, woe is me kind of thing. But that's the only injury I know of him ever having. And grandpa would say it was because he was really short and he uh, didn't have, didn't have as far to squat as the other guys, but that's a load of crap. He was just, he was, he was a tough cookie. His calves, even at like when, when he passed away at 90 years old and I mean, it's not like he was doing squats on the regular, his calves were like bowling balls. And he had from uh, like the tops of his knees down, there wasn't a single hair on his leg. It had all been kind of the hair follicles just totally toasted by the shin guards for so many years. Um, let's see. How did you pair the quotes so well with the Yogi Instance? That was all our director, Sean Mullen. And that was 
also thanks to the pandemic it gave him a lot of time to really comb through quotes and find stuff that really matched up philosophically with the with the yogisms and he did a great job um i also like how casey always called grandpa mr Berra. um i like the the quote that he said that grandpa could fall in the sewer and come up with a gold watch because that 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 really was kind of the way he uh lived his life he was lucky but i do think you make your own luck in a way and I think I say this a lot that, um, you know, there were a lot of baseball players who served in World War II. There were not a lot who actually saw active combat. Um, and the fact that grandpa was able to come home, you know, he, he was in D-Day. He was also, again, in another uh, amphibious landing. He was part of Operation um, Dra what was Dragoon, which was the invasion of southern France. So he did that twice um, and spent a, you know, a solid week on the water after each one of those landings, pulling the, the bodies of his fallen comrades out of the water. And I think that he, uh, there wasn't a single day that he lived after he came home from World War II where he wasn't super grateful for coming home um, and where he didn't think about the folks who didn't come home. And you know, they talk today about like having to practice gratitude. Like, Grandpa didn't have to practice that. Like he lived that every day of his life. And the fact that he was able to come home and play a kid's game for a living when everyone else had to go be accountants, he was super grateful for that. Um, you know, he he would tell you the best thing he ever won was my Grammy Carmen. Um, he, he just had so many things to be happy and, and, and grateful about. And I think when you, you know, approach your days like that, you end up being you know, just lucky by default, right? Um, baseball's new rules, it's interesting. He was, um, what year was it when they outlawed, after Buster Posey, when they outlawed the collisions at home plate? Hold on. Um, he was not real happy about that. He loved Buster, but he thought that you should be, um, you know, athletic enough to not get hit. He would say, I played 18 years catching behind home plate and I never once got bowled over. And he's like, I would get out of the way. You, My glove would be in your face and you would be out. Um, so he he wasn't real happy about that. Joe Torrey tells stories about all the calls he got after, because Joe was on the rules committee at that time with grandpa just calling him rootin' tootin' mad about them changing that rule. Um, the new, you know, they, they were starting at that time to talk about other other new rules and and you know um he was uh good friends with joe madden who was who would put the shift on all the time and 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 nobody could hit out of the shift they were all just hitting right into the shift and he thought it was totally ridiculous and i heard so many people say to him so many times that the players of his era there's no way that they could have hit today's pitching there's no way that um uh you know the the they couldn't hit the pitching. The pitchers couldn't strike out the, the, the hitters of today, like whatever they were saying. It, it's just impossible because everybody today is so much bigger and stronger and faster and more skilled than the players of your era. And grandpa would say, well, if they were so much bigger, stronger, faster, and more skilled, then why do you got to make all these concessions for them? Why do you got to change the rules so they can be better at baseball? So, I mean, I think, I don't think he would mind the pitch clock because he hated all the dilly dallying with the Velcro on the batting gloves. Um, but I think he would think the bigger bases are ridiculous. I think he would say, you know, for 150 years, there's been room for two guys on that bag. <laughs> why, why is there, why, 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 why now there's not enough room? Um, and I also, he always, he would say, um, that he thought, um, the problem with, the the bases was not that they were small. It was because they were hard. It was, it's called a bag for a reason, because it used to be soft, and and it used to break away if you slid into it. They only fixed them so it would be easier for the umpires to see what was happening. So if that was a soft bag, nobody would be getting hurt. You know, I don't know. So I don't think he would like that very much. Um, and and the fact that guy like the banning the shift, like you're a professional freaking hitter, hit it the other way for Christ's sake, whatever. Um, the Yankee Mount Rushmore should include the tent. I I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, he did love Buster Posey. He also really loved Yadier Molina. Um, those are the two that I remember the, the most of, of him. And he liked Austin Romine. <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, I don't, I don't remember, um, 
him specifically talking about others, but he, he watched so many games and, and he, he liked Pudge Rodriguez too, actually. Um, Ghost Runner would pro yes. Uh-huh. He didn't believe in people getting things they didn't earn. So the Ghost Runner, he would be like, what? <laughs> no. Um, the rift between Grandpa and George, um, you know, it, it happened. <laughs> um, I was six when he was fired by George and, um, you know, we didn't go, I was the only one of the grandkids who had any memories at Yankee stadium. Um, you know, because we just, we just didn't go when grandpa wasn't there. The rest of us did not go. Um, he was obviously upset. George had promised him that he would be able to manage the entirety of the 1985 season. He was fired 16 games in. So George went back on the promise um, I think grandpa would have been able to get over that, um, you know, because firing a manager is a baseball decision, a business decision. He would have been fine with that had George told him himself that he was fired. Instead, he sends Clyde King. And that was just not the right thing to do. Grandpa was very black and white, right and wrong, the most forthright moral compass in the history of the world. And he thought that that was not the right way to treat someone. Um, and he said he wouldn't go back until George apologized. He would see George at other baseball events, you know, over the years and they would converse. Hi, how are you? But he just wasn't he wasn't mean to George or anything. He just wasn't going back to Yankee Stadium until he got that apology. And I, if, if Susan Waldman hadn't engineered that, I don't know that George ever would have done that. But as soon as George came to the museum and said he was sorry, Grandpa was like, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. And he was at spring training for the next 13 years. And he was at one or two of the of games in every homestand and and. I'm I am personally very grateful for that because, you know, as nice as it was for the Yankee fans to have him back in the ballpark and as great as it was to have guys like Jeter and Posada and and uh, Paul O'Neill, like Bernie Williams, able to interact with and learn from grandpa. I think he just got just as much out of the deal. I think that going back probably extended his life by about 10 years. So I'm, I'm really happy um, about that. Um. Favorite picture is Yogi, Bill Dick, Alex Van Howard, and Thurman Musson. That, that's a great group of catchers right there. Um, he liked playing left field. He liked to run around. Um, when I was a kid, I uh, everybody always tried to make me a catcher, and I didn't like it because I was like too ADD to sit in one spot. And uh, I would say I like to play the outfield, and he would always tell me, "Oh, I like to play it too. You get to run, you know, get to get to run around." <laughs> um, he didn't really talk about. I mean, I, he, he would talk about, you know, had Kubek not gotten hit in the throat. Like there were all these things that happened in that game. That was a pretty wild game. Seven grandpa had a home run in that game too. Um, you know, he, he talked more about the things that led to that point. Like if this didn't happen, if that didn't happen, if this didn't happen, then that home run wouldn't have made a, a difference, you know? Um, yeah. I feel like I'm really just rambling. Sorry guys. <laughs> He, grandpa did not ask for any souvenir from old Yankee, Yankee stadium before it was torn down. Like I said, he didn't, he didn't keep much. And actually there was a commercial, um, Google Yogi Berra Yankee stadium ESPN commercial or something. When we get off of this, he did this really sweet, um, commercial for ESPN when the, they were tearing down the, the old Yankee stadium. And, uh, you know, he was pretty old at the time. And he, he said something like, I won't, I won't miss this place because it's all up in here. Um, and I think that's kind of the way he he felt about it. But it's, a, it's still a really good commercial. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said it was a good catch. Mrs. Payson... Uh, everybody loved Mrs. Payson. My grandmother loved Mrs. Payson. People who come to the museum like to belittle grandpa's time with the Mets. Um, but he spent 11 years with the Mets and he was really proud of his time with the Mets. Um, Mrs. Payson was a hoot. You know, she was a, a female, like self-made millionaire, bought the team with her own money, um, did whatever the heck she wanted. My grandmother used to say that they had a lot of fun with the Yankees because um, winning is fun, but they didn't know what real fun was until they joined the Mets. And a lot of that was because of Mrs. Payson. 
she told a story about um, a bunch of wives being out. Everybody was really drunk. And one of the ladies said, how come there's a Mr. Met, but there's no Mrs. Met. And Mrs. Payson was like, she smoked, had like a raspy voice. You want a Mrs. Met? I'll get you a Mrs. Met. Like a week later, Mrs. Met was on the field. Um, it came, she came out of a drunken wives dinner. Um, <laughs> but one other thing I'll tell you about the Mets grandpa. I was at a, um, a bat baseball assistance team charity dinner with him when I was in high school and they go around the room and they say they introduce the celebrity celebrity at each table and they do the whole three-time MVP, 10-time World Series champ, 18-time All-Star, Yogi Berra. He stands up, gives his little wave, sits down, backhands me across the chest to get my attention. Lance, how come nobody ever mentions that I managed the 1974 All-Star game? And I'm like, they just said that all nice stuff about you. Nobody gives a shit about the 1974 All-Star game. But the point was, he was the he, he had brought the 73 Mets to the pennant very improbably. He was only the second manager in history to bring a team from each league into the to the championship. And he wanted people to remember that he had had that success with the Mets. So, OK, 74 All-Star name it is, right? Like, it's very silly. Wow. Uh, let's see. My son's bar mitzvah. <laughs> That's cool. There's a lot of bar mitzvahs with Yogi Berra tables. I get a lot of pictures from my friends, uh, like whose kids are of that age, and they they're at the the Yogi Berra table, or they take a picture of the Yogi Berra table. It's cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just like that kids that are 13 and getting bar mitzvah even know who he is, which is fantastic. Yeah. Grandpa really thought Buddy Harrelson was safe. That um, 73. When they first started um, ESPN Classics, I remember going over there one night and my grandfather was in the living room watching that that game on ESPN Classic and my grandmother had dinner ready and he's standing there like three inches from the television. And my grandmother comes and he was like, what are you doing? And she sees that she's, he's waiting for the Buddy Harrelson play to happen because because he's on third base. And she goes, good God, Yogi, he was out in 1973 and he's going to be out now. Come eat your dinner before it gets cold. Um, he was he was funny. Nobody sits at the Yogi Barrow table. It's too crowded. Probably true. Anyway, he was awesome. My Grammy Carmen was awesome. I was really lucky. I had them till I was 37 and 39. I don't think there's a lot of people who get to have their grandparents for almost four decades. So that was a real uh a gift for me. Lindsay, how long were they married? 65 years. Amazing. And still like smitten with each other. Like it was, it was really cute. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, they were great. I've never been to Kajono actually. It's uh, north and north and west of Milan, almost to the Swiss border. Um, I have some internet friends from there now, so I probably should go there someday. And if anybody wants to come to the Grandpa's Museum, sure, let, let me know. Come on up. We'd love to have you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, it's almost World Series time. Um, anybody have any last minute questions for Lindsay? You can just yell them out. You don't have to type them. <laughs> yeah. This is fantastic. I really love the documentary yeah. and your questions. They were wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for being here. Thank yes. you for watching it. Tell your friends. Um, if you want to write a Rotten Tomatoes review, that's great. They actually really help. Okay. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Lindsay, next time you're in Baltimore, make sure to let us know and come by the Babe Ruth house. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, I'd like to do that. I, I've, I've never been there. Um, my brother keeps saying he wants to plan a Camden Yard trip because we haven't been in a while. So I will I will keep that in mind for sure. Absolutely. Um, and next year, uh, if you guys don't know, it's actually be uh, 50 years since the museum opened in uh, wow. July of 74. Cool. So, oh my um, it might yeah, coincide with an Orioles pennant. So that would be nice. It might coincide with what? A possible Orioles pennant. Ah, yeah. Yes. God, I was, so, I was kind of bummed about the Orioles this year, man. They were fun to watch. And it's the inexperience. It, it'll... I think we are the Houston of the next six or seven years. So, 
Yeah. Yep. I'm enjoying this Texas, Arizona business. Like, I don't care that it's not big markets, whatever. The baseball's been fun. I mean, that that, is. time notwithstanding, but I mean, game one was awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I like seeing somebody new and I'm married to a Phillies girl. So when they, when they bit the dust, I kind of smiled a little bit. <laughs> but, but had, to, had to protect my throat so people are hitting to opposite fields there's not a lot of strikeouts people are bunting like it's just fun baseball to fun watch like, and that's stolen bases oh, yeah great. it's been good i do really like trey turner though the phillies do you? Although, yeah i, I like him when he was in washington i'm not a harper guy not I, a harper. i'm not a huge harper guy either but man trey turner take a strike take a yeah strike in that situation come on it was horrible <laughs> so well with this crowd we could talk baseball all night but uh yeah go watch the game enjoy the game guys thank you so much thanks for watching the movie all thank right you. Lindsay. good thank night you, everybody Lindsay. we'll be in touch all right thanks guys thanks, thanks. thanks. Bye. very enjoyable right